This is Betsy Jensen, and you are listening to Unstoppable Body and Mind, episode 89, Teaching Your Brain It's Safe, interview with Dan Buglio. In this podcast, we learn to upgrade our brain and understand the power of our thoughts to heal and to create the results we want in our life. Become the person in control of your healing and make peace with your life. Become unstoppable, body and mind. Welcome today. We have a special guest, Dan Buglio. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Betsy. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I asked you on the show today. Dan is um, pretty well known in the pain world as far as chronic pain, kind of a YouTube sensation. You might describe him. <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it a sensation, but I, the audience is growing. Yeah, your audience is growing. And um, you've been doing daily YouTube videos for how long? A uh, 1,041 days in a row. Oh my gosh. Well, that so, is so impressive. In, I, I guess around April 1st, it'll be three years daily. Amazing. Well, I know there are a lot of people that really enjoy those videos every day, sure. but first let's just back up and have you introduce yourself a little bit more as far as what brought you to this pain world and healing chronic pain. Well, um, I don't remember what year it was, but I was in my early thirties. So probably about 23, 24 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I had my own bout of back pain. And for the first time in my life, I had back pain and took a few weeks to kind of resolve, mm -hmm. but then it came back and then it would go away and then it would come back and I didn't know what was going on. And of course, doing the standard mainstream medical stuff with, uh, you know, chiropractic, physical therapy, stretching, mm -hmm. not really getting anywhere. Here's a muscle relaxants. They didn't do a darn thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't really pursue it deep. The chiropractor said, oh, mild disc degeneration, but very, very mild, nothing to be concerned with. And this was muscle pain. It was muscle spasms that were really getting me. And about a year into that process, I discovered John Sarno. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I heard about Dr. Sarno on the Howard Stern radio show. Right. Howard was... Uh, treated by Dr. Sarno and pretty much claims that Dr. Sarno saved his life. And um, so I got the books and I started getting better. But then sure enough, even though I had the answer now, it would come back and then it would wow. go away and then it would come back again and it would take longer to go away. And, you know, ever since I found out about Dr. Sarno, it really took me another 12 years of trying to grapple with this mind body concept mm -hmm. before I kind of got it dialed in. Yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people, you know, quote Dr. Sarno's books is what saved their life and everything like that. But I don't believe Sarno's book is really a how to book. Mm -hmm. It's more of a knowledge book. Yeah. What's going on. Right. There's the 12 daily reminders, which he talks about, but it's, you know, my only conclusion when I kept on having the pain come back or stick around was I must not be doing these things correctly. Mm -hmm. Talk to your brain, think psychologically. Yeah. I've been doing that stuff. I must be doing it wrong. Yeah. Sometimes even so, having that knowledge, we'll use it against ourselves when the pain does come back, right? Like, oh, okay, well, now I'm not good at this and this is a me problem. And that's a very, very common thing in the mind body space. It's yeah. like, I just literally had somebody say, TMS might work for some people, but I don't think I'm strong enough. I'm like, yes, you are. Right. You're plenty strong, but it's, yeah. it, it's amazing how we take our insecurities and kind of put them on top of this healing process. And yes. they're not even on top of, they're just completely integrated. Yeah. It does seem like a lot of people have, you know, like pain is bad. And so it means you've done something wrong and pain-free is good and it means you're doing it right but it's nuanced and it you know we can learn from our pain when we accept it and and yeah. you know aren't fighting it right for sure absolutely yeah. so you you struggled for about 12 years on and off and then was there something that kind of clicked for you or how did that progress 
Well, I wish I could say there was like one thing that mm -hmm. clicked. Um, and when I'm asked to describe it, I'll say that I think accidentally I stumbled on a number of the concepts which I teach now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I didn't know that's what I was doing. It just kind of accidentally fell into place. Interesting. Um, you know, one of the main concepts that I teach these days is learning to take on an attitude of indifference towards yes. the symptoms. Let's talk more and, about that. That's so, so important. Yeah. And, and I think what I fell into was just, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. I got sick and tired of postponing things and avoiding things and not being able to do things. And I just finally was like, you know what, I'm going to hurt anyway. I may as well hurt while doing things and mm -hmm. kind of developed that. I guess I hit a wall, like I'm done with this. Yeah. And, uh, it really got to the point where I was able to get that indifference. I was like, all right, I'm hurting, but so what? I'm out playing golf with my buddies. I'd rather do that than sit home and hurt. Yeah. So, yes. you know, but it, it, it was that it was also learning to acknowledge and feel my emotions a little bit with more freedom. Because yeah. I had these uh, beliefs about emotions that I didn't want to feel certain emotions because that would make me an asshole like my father forgive uh, the language or <laughs> it would make me you know mentally ill with depression like my mom my two uncles and my grandmother mm -hmm. and i didn't so it took me a while to figure out that you know these emotions are actually okay and they're safe and so this is a combination of that the indifference mm -hmm. resuming life it didn't shut off in an instant either yeah oh, it was like it yeah. went away but then resuming activity was scary and yes. I'd still feel the, you know, the spasms and have to talk myself down. So. Yes. It's so it good you journey. have that lived experience, I'm sure. Cause some people have those dramatic healings, you know, but that's really the exception more than the rule. As far as, you know, when you're retraining your brain and your nervous system, it goes back to those old pathways. And so, yeah, just having that experience, you you've lived through it. Yeah, for sure. One thing I really like that you say is about getting out there and, you know, having fun. There was a quote you had recently that was, uh, if you want to feel better, start feeling better, right? Something like that. I, I think I missed Yeah, that. it was a quote that I saw and, and reposted. Yeah. Um, I think that's true. I like the Joe Dispenza quote, which says, think better than you feel. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And and giving him all that credit. It was funny. I, I heard that somewhere. One of the users on YouTube commented with that. And I was like, that's great. So I did a video on it. And somebody was like, oh, that's from Joe Dispenza. And I'm like, darn it. It is yeah. from Joe Dispenza. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, give him credit. But I think it's true. It's like we have to understand that TMS, by definition, this mind-body syndrome, and what I've now been calling perceived danger pain. Mm. Um. Because we need another name for it. Well, we do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we do, and I, I, we can talk about that. But yeah, um, by definition, yeah. it means that your body's already okay. Yes. Yeah. And your brain doesn't agree with that yet. But I, I don't view any of this as healing. I view it as mm -hmm. teaching. Yeah. I view it as yes. You know, people are like, a lot of people get into this TMS mind body space, and they go. All right, so you're telling me my body's fine. So what's wrong with my brain? Why is my brain doing this to me? Yes. And my standard position is your brain's not doing anything to you. Your brain's job, primary job is safety and survival. Yes. And for anybody who thinks their brain's gone rogue, no, your brain is working perfectly. Yeah. Even if you're racked in pain all over and other symptoms, your brain's working flawlessly to keep you safe from these perceived dangers. Yeah. It's just working with really bad data. Right. It's working with misinformation, this perception that the body is flawed and weak and frail and easily broken. And that emotions are scary and dangerous and stress is dangerous. Oh my God, I had a bad day of work and my body is killing me. Well, the brain's just doing what it can to keep you safe. And the only voice it has is pain. Mm-hmm. And when you don't really listen to it, it turns up the volume, doesn't it? Right. Or if we respond with a lot of urgency to the pain, like this is so important, 
I've got to really figure this out. I've got to fix this. Anything that we're drawing our energy to, we're going to create more of, right? So same thing. Yeah. I mean, fear and attention are what I believe turns a simple pain into chronic pain. Yes. And that with fear and attention, what does the brain do? It starts to create these neural pathways. Yes. And as long as you're staring at the pain going, when are you going to leave? When are you going to leave? You're using them. So it's not going to leave, which is why a lot of what I talk about is dial down the fear. Yes. So you can shift your attention away because some people are like, I'm trying to ignore the pain. It's not working. I can't ignore it because you're still terrified of it. Right. Right. And, exactly. And the accurate knowledge and acceptance that by definition, it means your brain's creating it. Your body's okay. Once you have that accurate knowledge, you can dial down the fear so yeah. that you can shift your attention away. But yeah. trying to shift your attention away while you're terrified, it's just impossible. That would be like saying, I know there's a tiger in the room with you, but don't look at it. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? That's a great analogy. Right. But it's true, though. It's like if you're terrified, it means you want to go back to step one, which is knowledge. What is actually going on? Step two is accepting that. It's like if you don't accept that that's what's really going on, you're going to have a hard time teaching your brain that, hey, there's nothing to fear. We're not in danger. What do you say to those people who are worried that they don't quite have that 100% belief that it's Um, TMS or neural circuit pain, as I've been calling it, or mind body. What what do you say to those people who who say, yes, I know I need to, it's my belief, but I'm just, I can't really believe a hundred percent. My answer to that is there is no such thing as a hundred percent. Because look, you know, somebody could be really on the mind body bandwagon, Mm -hmm. but if they have one doubt that goes, you know, maybe it is structural. They're not a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, Does that mean that mean- one thought is going to sabotage the whole recovery process? No. The yeah. brain believes what we think and say most often. Make sure your dominant thought is supportive, reassuring, calming, soothing. You know, and if you have a negative thought that goes, oh, I don't know, hope this shit works, <laughs> you know, or what if it doesn't? That's yeah, okay. We're going to keep moving. Have enough belief to get started. and to follow the process and to change your script because again this is a data issue your brain is working flawlessly even if you've got all sorts of crazy pains or symptoms yeah it's just working with bad data so fix the data accurate knowledge acceptance of that and then feed into your own brain using the mind to teach the brain and the subconscious that i'm really okay yes how do you teach that by actually responding to the symptoms as if it's no big deal. That's where indifference comes into play. You touched on that. Yes. Indifference means I feel it. It's not fun, but so what? Yeah. Because I know what's causing it. And if it's not my body, then what am I worried about? Yeah. It's not damaging me. Right. It's not like, you know, I had back pain for 13 years. I looked and all of a sudden my legs had fallen off of my torso. Nothing dangerous happened. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And I love that how you said earlier, like I can deal with the pain at home doing nothing, or I can go out and <laughs> have the pain, but do fun things. So yeah. it, it is really interesting how I think a lot of times we get very black and white you know, Mm -hmm. our brains are made that way, but especially with pain, we can kind of be like, I can't really do that until I'm out of pain. Oh, that would be nice, but I have all this pain. So just looking at it with kind of, you know, not that black and white perspective, I think helps. Yeah. And again, I believe this is a sales job. We're trying to teach our brain that we're okay. Mm -hmm. What better way to teach the brain that we're okay than for the brain to watch you go do normal things like go hang out with friends or family or, you know, sit on the floor and play with your kid as opposed to sitting on the couch going, don't jump on mommy. I'm hurting. Right. Right. Yeah. When the brain notices you doing normal things, when the brain realizes you're aware of the pain, but you're not overly concerned with it, what happens to the brain's fear level? It's like, well, she's not too afraid of this. Let's settle down. 
And I, I know I overly simplify this, but I say the best way to calm down the brain and the nervous system is to actually be calm. Yes. <laughs> ridiculously simple, stupid, but it's like, wait. And I have people look at me like, did you just tell me that the best way to calm the system down is to calm my, myself down? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Calm yeah. the F down. Yeah. I think I have another quote from you. I just remembered like nobody ever got better by freaking, by freaking out. out. By freaking out. No, it doesn't work that way. Why? There, because you're screaming at your brain, I'm in danger. Yes. Hypervigilant brain, your hypersensitive system goes, Yes. They're freaking out. Do not settle down at all. Stay vigilant. We're in trouble. And right. the brain's just here to keep us safe. So if you can stay out of the freak out zone consistently, your brain can't help but feel safer. Yes. So, I mean, these are core fundamentals like stop freaking out you know yeah your hair your hair is not on fire right. you have a headache right do, do you see that symptom imperative or they call it sometimes extinction bursts or i notice it a lot where like people will have less pain but start to get maybe more anxiety or insomnia kind of some of the mental kind of manifestations that can come sure. up you know a lot of this is Again, I'll use the term perceived danger, pain, or symptoms. Yes. And if the brain's perceiving danger, like, hey, your hand is on a hot stove, it's going to give you pain to get you to pull your hand off. Yeah. Um, so by definition, your brain is in a state of hypervigilance, always looking out for danger, like what's going on. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the nervous system is more active, more sensitive. I like to view it that the nervous system is picking up normal sensations from the body, mm -hmm. it's amplifying it in this hypervigilant brain, yes. which means a normal sensation, like I'm bending my elbow, the brain can go, what was that? There was a little mm -hmm. click, what, oh my God, what was that? And it can turn on pain. And if you freak out and stare at it, give it attention and fear, it can become persistent. Mm -hmm. So to your point about you know things like anxiety or insomnia, I think what happens is when people's original pain or symptom goes away, it's because they've done a really nice job at convincing the brain, you know what, I really don't have a back problem. Yeah. And when the brain finally believes that, it can let that pain go. Mm -hmm. But the brain and nervous system is still going, but what else is going to happen? Is there something else going on? And that can lead to being in the stress response, adrenaline, cortisol, stress hormones in our body. Well, that's what anxiety feels like. It's, it's the physical sensation of stress hormones in our body. Yes. Yeah, and so exactly. we can get that way. Yeah. Um, so I think the body is just hasn't settled down yet. Yeah. And so the best way to resolve the anxiety that crops up after the pain's gone is to just view it as another symptom of mind body and say, okay, it's temporary. It'll yeah. pass. Nothing dangerous is happening. Right. At all. Right? Anxiety is just a feeling. Right. And we can handle any of these feelings. We can handle that heart kind of racing. And, and when we're excited on a roller coaster, we kind of like it. Yeah. And so my general thought on anxiety is don't make anxiety a new problem to solve. Mm -hmm. it's I just the state that you're in as you're going on this journey and and i like to say that a lot of people will will give themselves anxiety attacks and even panic attacks trying to get rid of anxiety yes. and so if if the physical sensation <coughs> of anxiety is the <clears throat> the adrenaline and cortisol mm -hmm then stressing out about your anxiety is just pouring gasoline on the fire. Exactly. That's like stressing out about gastrointestinal problems. Right. Well, stress suppresses the digestive system. So stressing out about that gasoline fire, why isn't it going out? Because you're stressing out about a stress illness. Yeah. You know, if danger is what's driving all this, like anxiety is, is perceived danger. Something's going on. It's making me anxious. Social anxiety, work anxiety, physically worried about your body it's yeah, all perceived yeah. danger yes. so if danger is the challenge in my opinion safety is the solution 
to anxiety, to physical pain, to gastrointestinal immune system. Like your brain's just terrified. And there are people who are really in, in a bad state and they're like, but I'm getting worse. And I'm like, yes. And you're getting more and more afraid each and every day. Why aren't my symptoms getting better? Because you're scaring the crap out of yourself every day. Yes. That's not the way to teach your brain and nervous system to settle down. Right. Yeah. Well, when people are asking, you know, do you have specific techniques that you advise or, you know, like everyone wants a checklist, what's one through five that I can do to get out of pain? What's your response to someone who asks something like well, that? Well, I don't really have a checklist. I don't like homework. You know, in this mind body space, there's a lot of things to do. Mm-hmm. I've got to meditate. I've got to journal. I've got to do breathing exercises. I've got to count my breathing. I've got to, you know, right. there's so much to do. So I don't really give homework. Yeah. I just talk about fundamental principles. So the first and foremost is you got to get clear on what exactly is going on. Knowledge is first and foremost, without understanding that this is all created by the brain, you're gonna have a really tough time calming the system down. Because if you still think your body's a problem, you're gonna panic every time you move or eat foods or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so getting really clear has to be job number one. Mm -hmm. And then accepting that. Once you do that, the rest of the goal is just how do I convince my brain that I'm really not in trouble? Yeah. And so a good qualifying question is, is what I'm doing helping? I'll say, does it make you feel safer or more in danger? Mm -hmm. Which is why I don't like all of these fixing activities, like the breathing and the journaling and the meditation, because every time you do a fixing activity like that, you're doing it because you want the pain gone. Yes. So what do you do? You say, all right, I've just gotten done meditating. Did it work? Yep. Damn it. No, it didn't work. I still have the pain. I'm doing I'm it wrong. Doing, must be doing it wrong. I got to double down and do instead of half an hour a day, I got to do an hour a day or do an hour twice a day. Right. And I've absolutely worked with people who are spending six, eight hours a day consuming TMS material, podcasts, videos, mm-hmm. um, and I've literally spoken to people who said, Dan, I've watched every one of your videos. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's like 150 hours worth of videos. Yeah. But they they get so consumed with fixing themselves that the only the only thing the brain can can conclude is they're doing all this work. They must be really messed up. There's a big problem. So stay vigilant. Yes. They sensitive. We got a big problem because they're spending eight hours a day trying to fix themselves. They must be broken. Yes. Right. I love, I love the phrase, the brain has no choice. So when you are calm, not really caring about the symptoms, focus on living your life, trying to have some fun. The brain has no choice, but to go, Holy crap. Look at Betsy. She's having a good time. Things are good. But if on the other hand, you're in a panic, you wake up terrified, you have anxiety. So now you're freaking out. How do I get rid of anxiety? How do I get, mm-hmm. and you're now panicking about the anxiety. And then you're just thinking about, oh my God, the pain usually gets worse at lunchtime. Crap. It's a quarter to 12. It's going to be coming on and, 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 and before you know it, you're exhausted at the end of the day. Then you're worried that you can't sleep because you're so anxious and you're so jacked up from all this adrenaline and cortisol. Yeah. And then you stress out about not being able to sleep, which just fires more adrenaline and cortisol. And you lay in bed and go, how come I can't sleep? Because you've been terrifying yourself all day. Right. And then you're convincing yourself that if I don't sleep, tomorrow is going to be even worse. And it's it's a vicious cycle. Yes. Yeah. The answer is trust your body. It knows what to do. We need to get the thinking, catastrophic, worrying brain out of the way. Yeah, because the body truly does know what to do to heal any physical abnormalities. Yeah. The brain and body knows how to metabolize the stress hormones. If we can learn to get the mind and the brain out of the way. Yeah. So it stops filling up the bloodstream with more stress hormones. It's like, yeah, exactly. So is there a checklist? You know, I think it's absolutely knowledge. Got to start with that. 
acceptance of that knowledge. Yes. Those things are really what it takes to dial down the fear because without that, you're going to stay terrified. From there, I think there's several ways of teaching the brain that we're safe, mm -hmm. you know, emotionally, physically, mentally, you know, the whole indifference thing, which is what I call the mindset is really important. Focusing on living your life. These are things that we can do. How do you teach the brain emotions are safe by actually feeling them? Stop running away from emotions. Yes. yes. How do you teach the, bro the brain that the body is safe? No. Number one, don't freak out if you've got some sensations that you don't like. Yes. But number two, don't walk around the house like this all day. Oh my God, I'm so scared, right? Because you're not safe. The brain has no choice. Again, that statement I like. Yes. If you're walking around like this, even if you're saying the right things mentally, I'm safe, I'm safe, it's just TMS, I'm safe, your, your brain's going to go, no, you look terrified. Yeah, yeah, we you're did. in a posture. We relax the body yeah. so that we can breathe. And I used to say breathe, just breathe. No, but what if you're like this and somebody says, just breathe, you're going to be like, I can't, I yeah. can't fill my lungs. No, you got to relax the body first. Yeah. And then after that, the breath kind of takes care of itself. Yes. Right. So relax the body, breathe. Mindset or the mental state, I think, is really a challenging thing for us because many people who are TMSers were perfectionists, people pleasers, problem solvers, do gooders, yes. high achievers. So yes. we want to, like, I'm going to heal my TMS better than anybody. I'm going to get it done so fast and perfectly. Totally. And it doesn't work that yep. way. That's just more pressure more stress on yourself. And when it's not working, yes. more judgment, I'm doing it wrong. Totally. So the mental state, basically, I don't tell you, you got to stop your negative thinking. That's impossible. I don't tell you to fix your negative thinking and make it positive because yeah. that would be exhausting. Yes. Because yes. we have tens of thousands of thoughts a day. Yeah. If you had to fix them all, it'd be exhausting. Right. So my suggestion falls a little bit in the line of the three principles. Do you know what I mean by that? No. Sydney no, Banks. No. Oh, no. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh... Sydney Banks, three principles. Um, he's of the mindset that we experience life through our thinking. Okay. And what I've gathered from his world is we're going to have negative thoughts. We don't have to fix them. We don't have to get rid of them. But we also don't have to believe them. We don't have to take our own thinking exactly. so damn seriously. The thought that goes, oh, my God, I'm never going to get better. You can go watch it fly by. Exactly. Yeah. Because we oftentimes will grab onto those negative, fearful thoughts and ruminate on them and repeat yeah. them a thousand times a day. Yes. I think People it takes on a much easier flow state of just going, I don't need to do anything with those negative thoughts. Yeah. And trying to stay in this state of elation and perfect, you know, positive thinking is bullshit because if you have a negative thought, then you're going to judge I'm doing this thinking thing wrong. Exactly. And I, I joke that people are trying to fix their thinking yeah. with more thinking about their thinking because they think their thinking is bad yes. because their thinking is stinking. <laughs> and before you know it, you're tangling yourself up in knots. It's very meta. Yeah. You can't think your way out of a panic. Yeah. Well, I think it's when people hear that their thoughts are so powerful and that their thoughts, you know, are creating these things in their bodies. And so they're like, oh, I've got to be perfect with my thoughts all the time now. And of course they can't be, and that causes stress, but those thoughts will come up. It's whether we believe them or not. It's whether we, like you said, attach onto them, give them our energy or not. Yeah. Like if someone said, I hate your blue hair, you'd say, well, you'd laugh at them. Like that doesn't even make sense. You're like, I don't have blue, I don't hair. Have blue hair. Right. Yeah, be very I've absolutely like had people tell me, like I, I coached one guy and, you know, I try to make this fun and smile and laugh a little bit. I'm very animated and, mm -hmm. and man, I couldn't get this guy to crack a smile in a two hour conversation. Mm -hmm. I was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta learn to smile a little bit. Invite that back in. Yeah. He goes, I don't think I've smiled in five years. It's like, wow. And it comes down to this. He said, if I'm being truthful, I could never, ever treat somebody else as horribly as I treat myself. Mm -hmm. He says, the things I think about and say to myself, I have never, ever treated another human being like that.
Mm -hmm. Like, then why is that acceptable? Yeah. Right. And so the inner critic yes. needs to be silenced. We don't need to pay attention to the inner critic either. Yeah, that is huge for so many of us that have any kind of mind body issues. And people are like, but I'm having these thoughts. How can I not take them seriously? Okay, you got 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Yeah. Are you really that high on yourself to think that all those thoughts are true? Right, right, no. exactly. <laughs> not every thought you have is true. And uh, by the way, do you really think that all those thoughts are beneficial and helping you? Not hardly. We know that. The vast majority of that crap can go. It's just repetitive thoughts that we heard from doctors, from friends, from family, yes. from ourselves, from our upbringing. Yes. We're just repeating thoughts. Yeah. So what if we don't take them seriously? Life gets a hell of a lot easier when you can kind of laugh at your thoughts and go, ah, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And it feels so much different in your body too. Like those thoughts, a lot of times if you say a thought, you know, that's really heavy like that, like, oh, I'm I'm never going to do anything right. I'm, I'm so bad at this. My body's horrible. Like those feel heavier in your body. Oh, for sure. And then the judgment that I'm doing this thing called life wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you. I mean, self-esteem is such a huge issue globally, mm -hmm. especially in the mind body space, because everybody blames themselves for this. Yeah. And some people reject it outright because, no, you're not going to tell me that this is my fault. Yeah. Never true. said it was. Right. <laughs> true. Another thing I always say is this is not your fault. None of it is your fault. It's where you ended up. Yeah. But none of it was your fault. Yeah. The good news is there's a pathway out. Yes. It's called self-kindness, self-compassion. Yes. And honestly, if dangers what's feeding all this stuff safety is the solution yes it really yes. is if you yes. feel safe in your body and your thinking yes in your emotions your brain's not going to need to sound that warning called pain or other symptoms to protect you right. i was just thinking about this i've had this discussion with some people before but there are those tendencies we have to sometimes want to challenge ourselves right and so i hear people sometimes say like I want to challenge the pain. And what's your take on that? Depends on your fear levels. Yeah. Like say someone is uh, returning to an activity and they think it's going to be painful and they're just going to push through the pain because someone told them they're supposed to challenge their pain and push through it. Well, one of the things that Alan Gordon teaches in his book, The Way Out, is this thing called a corrective experience yeah. or a setback. Yeah. So if somebody says, all right, Sarno says resume activity and everybody else is saying, get moving again. Mm -hmm. I'm terrified of the pain, but I'm going to go for a jog. Mm -hmm. And the brain goes, stop it. What are you doing? You're crazy. Why? Yeah. Because the brain is sensing your fear. Yeah. Sensing the danger believes maybe still that it's a physical thing. So it's going to warn you with pain. And if you go do this and you end up with excruciating pain that lasts a few days before it settles back down, was that a corrective experience or was that a setback? Sounds like a setback. Yeah. So Alan Gordon talks about it as pain reprocessing therapy. Mm -hmm. I just did a video on it not too long ago called Six Steps to Resuming Activity. Mm -hmm. which is kind of like taking Alan's pain reprocessing and adding a couple of things, oh, right? Nice. So visualize what you want to do. Decide what you want to do. I'm yeah. going to resume activity. I'm going to go out and take a long walk. Okay. Well, can you get to the kitchen and back without pain? No. Then don't worry about a five mile walk. Yeah. I'm not ready <laughs> exactly. for that. Exactly. Yes. Because some people will decide, well, I have to push myself. So I'm going to do this. And then a half a mile from their house, they're going to call their spouse and go, pick me up. I can't yeah. move. <laughs> right. Yeah. What you have, I think visualizing a positive outcome, expecting a positive outcome yes. and then graded exposure. Yes. So, you know, people are like, well, that'll take a long time. Yeah. It takes longer if you don't do it that way. Right. You know, uh, one of my first success stories that I published on YouTube was this guy named Bill mm -hmm. and he had crippling knee pain where he couldn't get across into the kitchen without practically screaming out in pain. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Horrible. Stairs, forget about it, right? And he took on this process. He'd start imagining himself being able to walk to the kitchen pain-free. But, what, you know, if, if I were to say to somebody who had a lot of pain, imagine yourself walking, but yet walking is painful, a lot of them will go, oh, no, I don't want to imagine that. Right. So they're feeling the anxiety building up just by imagining it. Yeah. In some cases, people will imagine something and actually hurt yes. while they're still comfortable on the couch. Totally. So you got to practice in your head first. Yeah. Once the head starts being able to envision this without the anxiety, you're ready to start doing this graded exposure thing, which mm -hmm. means you try it. And in Bill's case, his journey back to walking was to stand up and sit down. Mm -hmm. And he did that for like a week. Yeah. Until he could do it without hurting. Mm -hmm. And then he would might take a lap around the dining room table and sit back down again. Yeah. You know, within a month's time, he was walking out a hundred yard driveway to get the mail. Mm -hmm. You know, within two or three months' time, he was doing three to five mile walks. Amazing. Yeah. And I worked with a lady who told me a story about uh sitting pain. Mm-hmm which in the pelvic pain community is very common, sitting pain. This lady couldn't sit down for five seconds, but she utilized this type of process to, gra to visualize, gradually expose herself to it five seconds at a time. She did that for a week, then 10 seconds. Three months later, she jumped in the car and did a three hour drive. Amazing. So this is how you gradually get your life back. For the yeah. person who says, I need to push through. I'm sorry, a lot of people read Steve Ozanich's book the wonderful man, brilliant, amazing book. But his story was that he tortured himself for nine months by going on these runs through excruciating pain. Wow. Right. And I've even had people say, Dan, I'm, I'm contemplating. Do I need to go full Ozonich to get better? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. That sounds yeah. like your brain would interpret that as dangerous. And what the heck are you doing? Right? And why does the pain go up when we start to resume activity? Because the brain's going, what are you doing? I'm warning yeah. you, don't do that. And you're not listening. So I'm going to turn up the volume Yeah. until you listen, until right. you're calling your spouse saying, pick me up because I can't walk home. Yeah. So I think safety is a way to go. How do you teach yourself safety in moving, resuming activity? Gradually. But you envision it first. And yes. if... The pain does come during that activity. The most important thing to do is call that out for what it is. Mm -hmm. It's just my brain perceiving danger and trying to warn me. So I'm not going to flip out over it. Yeah. I'm not going to panic because I felt the pain. I'm yeah. not going to judge that I'm doing this wrong. I'm just going to reassure myself. Brain, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I know you don't think this is safe, but it is. I'm only doing a little bit. Yeah. I'm only doing it for five, 10 seconds. I can do this. Yeah. And eventually the brain learns like, wow, look, she's gone from five seconds to a minute and a half to five minutes to 10 minutes, Yeah, you know, and gradually I think is great because that's safety. And look, if you have zero fear about it, you can probably jump in quicker than some, right. but if you're terrified, yes. I'm terrified of sitting down. Well, yeah, that's a good indicator that you're going to want to ease into it very slow. Right. People are like, I hurt when I get out of bed. How can I gradually get out of bed? I'm like, sit up in bed, throw a leg over the side, and then go back. Uh, and then throw yeah, both yeah. legs over. Like, you can yeah. break down almost yeah. anything into totally. little tiny chunks. Right. Yeah. And some people are like, but I can't help it. I have to go to, you know, my family's house to, for whatever. It's going to hurt. Okay, so that's not when you practice this. Yes. That's when you <laughs> kind of just reassure yourself, relax your body, breathe. Don't yeah. fall into the freak out, you know. Yes. So it all works together. The entire goal of everything I teach is to, to train your brain. That there's really no danger. Yes. That's really the whole approach. I don't work on backs or knees or shoulders or headaches or pelvic pain. I don't do any of that stuff. As a matter of fact, in most of the group coaching calls, we don't talk about symptoms. Mm. Very little. It comes up. Sure. But very little. And people are like, well, but I have this kind of pain. What do I do different? nothing right convince your brain that your type of pain your flavor of pain 
is no different than anybody else's. People are like, I wish I just had back pain. I go, yeah, I had it for 13 years. I wouldn't will that upon anybody. It was excruciating much of that time. Right. But my pain is so much worse. How do you know? Right. Comparison is not helping. No. Yeah. Are there any really interesting stories that come to mind in the work that you've done? They're all interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I will say this. The more somebody feels like they're in chaos, Mm -hmm. they've got multiple symptoms, they're all out of control, and now they've got the anxiety and the depression and the despair and the hopelessness, and everything seems to be going sideways. Mm -hmm. The answer is still the same. Mm -hmm. It really is. The solution is still going, shh, time Mm -hmm. out. Come here. How would you how would you calm a scared dog? And I did a video on this. Mm-hmm. Terrified dog being abused its whole life. How do you how do you how do you resolve that? You don't go, hey dog, come here, tell me about your childhood. Were yeah. you beating a puppy? <laughs> no. That would be terrifying, which is right? why I think a lot of this go back and revisit your traumas is terrifying to some people. Yes. Which I don't force people to do. First of all, I'm not qualified yeah. to guide somebody through that. But second of all, I don't know that that helps teach your brain that you're safe today by revisiting all the ho- all the horrible shit that happened when you were a kid. Yes. And you know. you know that process I walked you through as far as resuming activity? Yeah. It works exceptionally well for insomnia. Oh. People oh, go really? to bed, they're like, oh, God, it's almost time to go to bed. I'm not going to fall asleep. I'm going to yeah. stare at the ceiling all night, and then I'm not going to feel good tomorrow. And Yeah. Well, they're scaring the crap out of themselves before they even get into bed because they're so desperate to sleep that they're so panicked that they won't, that they're firing up the stress response, adrenaline and cortisol. And it's like, how come I can't fall asleep? Well, because you spent the last two hours terrifying yourself about not falling asleep. So now you're flooded with adrenaline and cortisol and your brain's going, don't you dare fall asleep. You're in danger. Don't fall asleep. Uh, Yeah. Right. So you gotta be on the lookout. Envisioning, how about envisioning your bed as your sanctuary, yeah. as your wonderful place? Yeah. And people are like, yeah, but I'll wake up at three in, three in the morning. And I'm like, okay, what's your response? I get pissed off. I'm like, why? That's just firing up more adrenaline, exactly. which says, don't go to bed. Yes. So what do you do when you wake up and it's three o'clock? You go, oh, goody. It's, I still have four more hours to sleep. Yeah. Roll over. <laughs> It's all in our response. It really is. The more we get stressed about not having sleep, the less we sleep. Somebody shared a story with me. They said, you know, when I was a little girl, I used to have insomnia. I couldn't sleep. My mother fixed it for me like that. You know what she told me? She says, oh, honey, it doesn't matter if you sleep or not. As long as you lay there quiet with your eyes closed, Mm -hmm. you're still getting rest. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's what happened. She laid there quiet with her eyes closed and she wasn't stressing out about not sleeping. Yes. She fell asleep. Yes. She never had a problem. Yeah, I've used that thought myself that my body will get the sleep when it needs to. That's a good one. And that just lying here with my eyes closed is a form of rest. And then that works. <laughs> This has been amazing. I really have enjoyed- We could chat all day, I'm sure. Yeah, we literally could. I mean, definitely, um, I think we, we are so aligned on so much of the stuff that we teach. And I've seen you in some of the same trainings that you know I go to. Oh, there's one analogy too that I've used several times I'd love to credit mm-hmm. you for. Coughing up the phlegm. Do you remember that one <laughs> that you did? Yeah. The way I use it is like, you don't have to go looking for the trauma to, to resolve. You know, when it comes up, you cough it out, right? If that phlegm comes up, you cough it out, but you don't really have to go trying to dig around or worry about like, if it comes up, I'm not going to handle it. You're just like, oh, comes up, cough it out, resolve that. Yeah. I like to say, you know, we don't have past emotions. Mm. We don't. We have emotions about our past. If we conjure up the memory of our past. Yes. But if you're feeling emotions about your past, it's still right now. Present. You can't yeah. you can't experience sadness in the past. That's already gone. It's the only thing you can do is now. So I've been focusing really on the core of how does this system work? Mm-hmm. Why is the brain creating sensations or symptoms? 
Yeah. I think it's perceived danger. And I know we don't need another acronym. <laughs> I, I really do believe, and I've heard a lot of people say that perceived danger explains it better than many of the other ones. Yes. If that's the case, then why wouldn't we just focus our, all, of our, all of our attention on saying to the brain, yeah, it's okay, you're good. We right. got you. You're all right. Yeah. There's no danger. How do we do that? By actually thinking and behaving calmly and not yeah. freaking out, running around chasing ourselves with a hatchet, screaming, we're in danger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know some folks who just are so deep in the symptoms yeah. and so terrified. They're saying, it can't be TMS because nothing is shifting. I'm like, yeah, because you're absolutely terrified. Yeah. And the more afraid you get, yeah. the more symptoms you get. Yes. Like, yeah, but I hear people's symptoms moving. I don't, mine don't move. I just get extra ones. Like, because you are more and more and more terrified. Yeah. And a terrified brain doesn't operate this human body that efficiently. Right. It's a survival state. I mean, if you go into fight or flight or freeze and fawn, you're not getting blood to your prefrontal cortex. You're in a survival state. And it's like you said, I think of it as the danger perception, you know, happens with the brain and nervous system subconsciously kind of throws you into one of those survival states, but that's how, you know, that's how, you know, you need to get back to safety is you have those cues of the body, either it's the pain or it's the heart rate, or you're like, Oh, I feel really fatigued and shut down and overwhelmed. I'm in freeze. And you just get yourself back to safety each time. Yeah. And that retrains that nervous system that we don't have to freak out about every little thing. You know, this mm -hmm. information doesn't mean you need to shut down. It means you need to take one step at a time. Yep. Yeah. So one last point I just wanted to share is I often say when, when you are deep in a symptom and, and your thinking is taking you to freak out zone, you can't think your way out of that. Why? Because you just said your rational thought, you said prefrontal cortex doesn't get the blood flow. Yeah. Rational thought is offline. Yeah. It doesn't work anymore. You are yeah. simply in survival and your brain's going, oh my God, what do we got to do? Yeah. So I say, don't try to think your way out of that. Yes. It won't help. I agree. You can always go back to relaxing your body and breathing. Yes. Because if you can do that yeah. even for a short 10 15 seconds guess what slows down your thinking the yeah. thinking that's spiraling and freak out starts to yeah. slow down what happens to the emotions they start to simmer as well yes. because again this this phrase that i like when you can calm your body and breathe your brain has no choice yeah. but to perceive that oh Maybe he or she is not in really big trouble. Because yeah. if you were, you'd be hyperventilating and freaking out mentally. Yeah. So don't yeah. try to think your way out of a yes. panic attack or a deep flare where you're literally freaking out and doing the catastrophic thinking about, oh my God, if I'm this bad now, I'm going to be living in a cardboard box under the highway soon because yep. everybody in my life will leave me and I'll be unemployed. And, 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 and you know, yeah. we've all yeah. done that. Worst case scenario. And so hope is critical. Yeah. And, you know, that's why I give the videos every day. Yes. Little dose of Dan. A <laughs> little dose of Dan every day. Well, you have a lot of people that really appreciate that. And um, I think it, you know, is changing so many lives. And I know it has. I, what are you up to? A million views or something? I, Just on okay. YouTube. Just on YouTube. Yeah. Just on YouTube. I'm over a million views. And... Facebook, I mean, I got a community there of 6,500 yeah. and I post all the videos on Facebook too. And I would say that I have at least that many views on Facebook as well. Yeah. Um, so getting lots of views, the feedback is very humbling and very positive. Um, but it's amazing to hear messages from around the globe, getting better just for my daily free videos. Amazing. Yeah. So where can people check you out? If they want to find you well the brand is pain free you mm -hmm. so you can search facebook for that i have a, a group there uh youtube search for pain free you channel mm -hmm. um the website is painfreeyou.com mm -hmm. and uh 
you know, I do individual coaching as well as have a group program, mm -hmm. which includes a video based course and weekly group uh, Q and a type of uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, that's the least expensive way to get the most amount of help. You can participate in four or five weekly calls yeah. that can last hours long. Wow. You get all sorts of support plus have a course and yeah. it's cheaper than one session with me. So yeah. Yeah. And that's new since we last talked. So congratulations. Yeah, on that was year. June. I launched it. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I've got a lot of people in there. It's been great. Yeah. And that can be found at painforyou.com. There's a link at the top for the group coaching program. Amazing. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time coming on the show today. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah. So good to talk to you. And That's, hopefully we'll been talk a pleasure. again sometime. <laughs> been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, now, if you want to learn more about how to regulate your nervous system, how to process emotions, how to process pain, how to rewire your brain, how to make decisions, have boundaries, and have more fun in your life, then I'm happy to announce that I have just the program for you starting February 22nd to 2222. This is a program all about alignment. And I'm not talking about the alignment that I talked about as a physical therapist for over 20 years. I'm not talking about the physical alignment of your spine and your body, but the alignment of yourself with your body, with your inner self, with the knowledge and power that you have within you that is responsible for healing that will help you with making decisions and being true to yourself. Alignment is just getting to that parasympathetic calm state, the ventral state where you are connected, where you are collected, where you're creative, where you're playful and getting to that state more and more often in your life will result in better healing, increased immunity, decrease of current pain, and more fun in your life, more flow and ease and serendipities. If you have chronic pain or disease, your body has brought you to this point where you probably notice the more you focus on it and try to fix it, the worse things are becoming, the more it's spreading. The answer is tuning into your body, learning about yourself, learning not only what the real root cause is of your pain, but more importantly, what to do now. If you think that possibly life could be easier, that you don't need to work hard all of the time and try to give from an empty cup, please click the link in the show notes and get on my email interest list for six months, working with me in a small group on your personal alignment. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned a little bit about your brain today that helps you in your life like it helped me. Please be sure and subscribe and leave a review. And of course, be sure and share this podcast with someone you know that wants an unstoppable body and mind.